Good morning. You know, every time I hear that music, I just get this compulsion to let my mullet grow. I mean, I don't know about, uh, I don't know about you guys. Well, you know what, guys? This is actually my favorite part of the job, but not, not the preaching part here, but the baptizing part. That's one of the things that I love to do, and, and uh, I'm so glad that you guys were able to be here to witness the work that God is doing in the lives of those who attend Bayview Glen Church. It's, it's amazing because I really believe that all of us as disciples of Jesus, it's important that we continue to take our next steps as disciples and all of us grow in our ability to reflect the character and priorities of Jesus. Because that, at the end of the day, is what a disciple really is, right? Someone who grows to reflect the character and priorities of Jesus in all of life. And so this series, Follow, that we've designed, what we're trying to do is introduce practices to you so that you can actually put, uh, practice these things in your life to help you become more and more like Jesus. And one of the things that uh, Lucas has introduced us to is this concept called the Talmudim. And what we realize is that in first uh, century Palestine, when Jesus was on, it wasn't uncommon for a rabbi to have disciples, all right? I mean, that's how they replicated themselves. That's how they reproduced themselves. And the thing is, is that uh, students just didn't want to learn from the rabbi, all right? They just didn't come to the rabbi's feet to sit there and learn from them. Students just didn't want to learn from the rabbi. They actually wanted to be the rabbi. They wanted to become the rabbi, and so what happens is that these, these, uh, eventually these Talmudin would, would become a rabbi themselves. And the rabbi who had discipled them to, the, in, to this process or to this point would then send them out to recruit their own Talmudin and teach, to teach those Talmudin as they had been taught. You know, this is exactly what Jesus is doing in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 to 20, when he says this, "'Go and therefore make disciples of all nations.'" baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. You see, this command was not just given to his disciples, but was given to all the followers of Jesus who would follow his disciples, and that includes you and I. You see, to be a disciple maker or a disciple of Jesus means that we are also disciple makers. To be a disciple of Jesus means that we are also disciple makers. And so as we introduce these four Ds, uh, these four disciple making practices, they're not only for you to help you grow in what it means to reflect the character and priorities of Jesus in all of life, but they're for you to help others do the same thing so that we can make disciples who make disciples. And so the first practice that we looked at a few weeks ago was this, discovering a life connected to God and others. Do you know the only time that God said when he was creating the world that things were not good? Do you remember what that was? It was when he was alone, when Adam was alone. God actually said, it is not good for the man to be alone, which I find very interesting because in reality, the man wasn't alone, right? He was with God. He had God with him. God walked with him in the garden, yet God said that it is not good that he was alone. You know, sometimes as Christians, we say things like, all I need is God. All I need is God. Which I actually find kind of funny because God doesn't think that. He actually doesn't think that. You see, we are communal beings, and God designed us to live and connected to both him and others. The second disciple-making practice that we looked at was dedicating ourselves to God's word and prayer. You know, like Lucas has said, we chose these words purposefully. Dedicating ourselves to God's word is more than just uh, disciplining ourselves to read the Bible. We believe that God speaks to us through the scripture by his Holy Spirit. And so dedicating ourselves to God's word and prayer is about reading the scripture and then prayerfully listening to what God may be saying to us through it, and then putting that into practice. And that's why if you are in a life group, there are always questions that are designed, that are geared towards us discerning what God may be saying to us through the passage of scripture, so that we can then put those things into practice, like the apostle James says, becoming doers of the word and not hearers only. The third practice that we're going to jump into in a couple weeks is declaring the good news about Jesus. And Lucas is going to address that, like I said, at a subsequent week. But we know this already. We know that the good news about Jesus needs to be shared, right? 
We know the good news needs to be shared. But we also know this, that the good news needs to be lived. When I was uh, uh, living in Montreal, uh, after Hurricane Katrina struck in 2007, I actually took a team of students and young adults down to the Gulf uh, Coast region. We didn't go to New Orleans, but we went to a community called Waveland, Mississippi, because believe it or not, although New Orleans was devastated, uh, the Mississippi Gulf Coast was actually more so. That's where most of the surge from Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Katrina went. And so as I was down there at the camp that uh, we stayed at as, as we were getting ready to build homes and repair houses and all that kind of stuff, I bumped into this guy named Richard. Now, Richard was like this retired old guy from Wisconsin. You know, you p- picture my dad, only a little, wrink- little more wrinkly, all right? So uh, that, that, was, that was Richard. And Richard was, was an awesome guy. He was really talented at rebuilding homes and was such a generous individual. But Richard struggled with guys like me, all right? Guys who came down to rebuild houses and had no idea what we were doing. All right, and so the thing is, is Richard, for some reason, uh, attached himself to me, and uh, he taught me how to do the ins and outs of drywall. And so, if you should co- you should come over to my house sometime, you can see the uh, the actual evidence of Richard's uh, impact on my life. But the reality was, is that Richard had a real problem with the fact that there was a bunch of teams that were down there that were rebuilding people's homes, but didn't know what they were doing. And so he approached the, the, the director of the camp and he said, you know, um, I, I love it that we're down here. We got all this energy and that, you know, we're really trying to rebuild people's houses. I think this is great. But I, I just have a problem with the, the quality of work that's being done. You see, because people actually have to move back into these things. They, they actually have to move back into their home. And then we want their homes to be a place that they can enjoy, you know, uh, living in. And the camp director looked at Richard and he said, you know, Richard, that, that's a really good point, but here, here's the deal, is that we're more concerned about, you know, their spiritual needs and not so much the, their physical needs. We're not so much concerned about their physical needs and Richard just kind of stopped right there and Richard was a very astute guy and he just looked at this camp director and he said, well, can't we do both? You see, Richard was right. The good news about Jesus isn't really good news for the world unless it has a transforming effect on all of life. The good news needs to be demonstrated. And this brings us to the fourth D of our disciple-making practices, demonstrating the good news about Jesus in all of life demonstrating the good news about Jesus in all of life. And so before we jump into this practice, we have to ask ourselves, what is the good news about Jesus? And we're just gonna go over this very briefly. What is the good news about Jesus? You see, for a lot of us, the good news about Jesus is that he died for my sins so that I, or he died for me so that I could have my sins forgiven and experience eternal life in heaven after I die. And I can say all all of this is true. But if we dive back in to God's story, If we dive back into God's story about Jesus, the gospel gets expanded. Beyond just good news for me individually, but good news for all of life. And so if we jump back into God's story, we understand in the setting of the story that God created the world. And when I think about God creating the world, the the words that I like to use to describe what that world was like when God first created was like a world that was all held in tension, a world that was held in balance and harmony. I mean, everybody had everything that they need. The world was able to supply all the needs that that the humans had, and and it was amazing that, that, uh, that this was able to happen. And so God, in this garden, he placed Adam and Eve. He placed humanity. And the whole purpose of placing them in the garden was this, was that they were supposed to reflect God to his creation. I mean, that's why he made them in his image. And so as they reflected God to the creation so that the creation would know that there is a good and benevolent God who loves them and loves all that he has made, they would then reflect these praises of him back to the Father, back to the creator. And so they, reflect, they, they reflected uh, the image of God to creation and his pray, the praises of creation back to him. But we know that humanity rejected their God-given purpose and that this world that was held in tension, like when you have tension on a spring and you let it go, the world just sprung 
And so what happened was that a world that was in balance and harmony was no longer that way, that through the human's decision and their rejection and rebellion against God, they introduced death and chaos and disorder into the narrative now. And so now this good, perfect, and, and, and balanced world devolved into chaos and loss, and like I've said, this way of death that had now entered into God's creation. And we don't have to read far into the story to see the effects of this death. You know, when we look at Adam and Eve right away, I mean, what, when I talk about, you know, marriage with those who are, are preparing for marriage, I always talk about marriage as being this experience of oneness. And in chapter 2 of Genesis, we see that Adam and Eve did experience this oneness. I mean, they were both standing in the garden, and the scriptures say they were naked and they felt no shame. But then we flip the page into chapter 3, and what happens is now all of a sudden they are ashamed. And they hide, they hide themselves by creating clothes out of fig leaves. They hide from one another. And so this relationship that they had in which they were supposed to, supposed to experience oneness and intimacy and beauty now was replaced with a relationship that was full of suspicion and mistrust and shame. And they blamed one another for what had happened. You know, we see death introduced into the relationship between Adam and Eve and God as well. You know, be, before, um, the scriptures tell us, before Adam and Eve rejected God, it says that God used to walk with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day in the garden. But after they had rejected him, when God enters the garden the, sec, the, the next time, what do they do? They hide from him. And so there was no, the relationship they had with God was no longer life-giving to them. It was, it, it was, a, it was a, a, a relationship in which they now experience fear, in which they now experience shame. And we see that Adam and Eve were then banished from the garden, which points us to the next thing about what was lost and how death was introduced, because as Adam and Eve were banished from the garden, they were removed from a place that had provided everything that they needed. It had provided food, uh, clothing, a shelter, all of that kind of stuff had been provided for them in the garden. And now for the first time in their lives, Adam and Eve are faced with scarcity. They're faced with scarcity. Now the, the, they have to work the land in order to produce food for themselves. And so they're faced with the question, am I going to have enough? I mean, how many of us ask ourselves that question? As we live from paycheck to paycheck, and we ask ourselves sometimes, do I have enough? Am I going to have enough? And we're faced with this concept of scarcity. Well, after uh, Adam and Eve were outside the garden, they gave birth to Cain and Abel. And what we see is the first murder that happens in God's created order. We see it happening in, in, in the con context of a family where a brother kills another brother. We continue to go through the story and the final break that I see here, the final way that death was introduced was actually uh, in the self. Humans lost the understanding of who they were. They experienced this death of a relationship even with themselves and understanding who God had made them to be. They had lost their understanding of what it me meant to be created in God's image. They rejected the purpose for which they had been created for. They now define good and evil according to their own desires and like we talked about a couple weeks ago, sought to make a name for themselves creating themselves in their own image. It kind of reads like the news feed on your phone, doesn't it? You see the roots of these losses run deep. And we see the fruit of those actions. We see the fruit of this brokenness and death all around us today. But we're supposed to be talking about the good news about Jesus, right? <laughs> so let's shift gears here, and uh, let's jump up as we keep going uh, through the story, as we move from the conflict through the rising action, let's get to the climax, because that's where the good news about Jesus comes in. Because what we see here is that God sends his son into our world of chaos, into our world of loss and death. He sends his son Jesus, who takes on flesh, and understands then what it means to be human. And Jesus declares this message that the kingdom of God is here. He says it all over the place. He talks about the kingdom. 
Now, I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes when I think about the kingdom of God, I, I, I kind of struggle with understanding what that actually means and why, why it's good news, why Jesus pro- proclaiming the kingdom of God is good news. You see, because kingdom is so foreign to us. We don't understand, you know, this concept of kings and kingdoms. There's only a few of them that are left on our planet, and I wouldn't say they're great examples of what monarchy should be. But let's, let's try to imagine for a little bit what it's like to be a king. I mean, when a new king takes the throne, what happens? I mean, the king inter- starts to introduce new laws, right? He introduces new rules. The king might introduce new festivals. He introduces new culture. He introduces new, a new way to live. And that's the good news that we get to experience about Jesus is that what he does when he declares the kingdom of God, he is declaring that there is a new way to live in the world. Life has come. When he says things like, the first will be last and the last shall be first. Wow. How can we read that, read that and not expect that there's going to be some kind of change coming? First will be last and the last will be first. Jesus and the good news about him is that he introduced a new way of life. He flipped an old, an old way of living, a way that leads to, leads to death. He flipped that on its head. And he declares that God's kingdom has arrived. That God's kingdom has come. And so when Jesus says that he is making all things new, like we read in the book of Revelation, he really is. He really is making all things new. He's inviting us into a new way to live. And this, if we still don't believe this, the the most uh, effective display that Jesus makes in which he demonstrates this new way of life for us is the fact that when he, after he died, he was resurrected. He didn't stay dead and so he deals the death blow to death. And he brings life to life. It's amazing. It's good news. And Jesus, all through the scriptures, he makes reference to the good works as evidence of the kingdom. Listen to uh, John chapter 14, verses 11 and 12. Jesus here is talking to his disciples. And uh, in John chapter 14, it's in the middle of this kind of really long conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples. And what happens here is that his disciples are kind of like, you know, they're, they're not exactly sure what's going on. They're still not exactly sure if they should put their faith and believe that Jesus is who he says he is, that this new kingdom of God has actually arrived. And so Jesus says this. He says, believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater works than these because I am going to the Father. Jesus says, hey, if you don't quite understand who I am, if you don't understand that who I am as the Messiah, at least look to the things that I've done. Every healing Every demon I've exercised, every miracle that I've, that I've done, it's all about the kingdom. It's to show you that the kingdom of God is tangibly here. This new way of life has now been introduced. The Mishnah, a book of Jewish oral teachings, says this. It says, your father brings you into this world, but your rabbi brings you into the world to come. Your rabbi brings you into the world to come. And this is what Jesus did. Jesus poured his life into his disciples because he was preparing them for the world to come. He was preparing them to live in this new kingdom, in this new way. And so if we keep going through the story, after the climax comes the falling action, and the falling action is actually my favorite part of the story. If you are familiar with how a plot graph of a short story works, what happens in the falling action is this, is that it actually starts to resolve the conflict and the crisis that were introduced to us in the rising action. And so it's my favorite part of the story because we get to see how God is gonna go about actually restoring the things that were lost, restoring the things that were broken. And so we come across Acts chapter two, and we, we read a description of the early church. You know, Acts chapter two was the first 
tangible expression of the kingdom of God. Post Jesus. First tangible expression of the kingdom of God after Jesus has ascended. And we see in the early church, life brought to what was lost and dead uh, in the crisis. And so let's look at Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. And they read like this. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. If we look at what was happening in that early church community and compared to the death and the loss that happened in the crisis, here's what we get. You see the oneness that was broken between Adam and Eve now all of a sudden is renewed in community. It's renewed in this, in this early church community. They lived as one and they had all things in common. They experienced oneness as a church. You know, family was renewed. Even a stranger among them had a, found a place around the tables of the believers. I mean, it says in the message that every meal that the early church celebrated became a celebration. Every meal was a celebration and strangers were welcomed into homes and got to experience what it was like to be part of a new family. This issue of scarcity that has been faced throughout the history of humanity was now put to rest because scarcity was what? It was met with generosity. It says in that passage of scripture that no one had need. Everyone had enough. And if people didn't have enough, then people, the people in the early church would sell their, their things, sell lands, whatever it was that they had, and they would give to the poor, and they would make sure that everybody in their community was looked after. Can you imagine that? That is amazing to me. And instead of experiencing fear and shame when their relationship, with their relationship with God, what happened? Well, they were filled with awe and wonder about him as, as miracles were performed amongst them as evidence that God's presence was actually there with them in the midst of their community. And they had rediscovered their purpose as the image of God. It says uh, they... Uh, you know, they, they, they praised God, and so they reflected the praises of the people. They reflected the praises of creation back to him as they imaged God to the world in such a powerful way that, get this, people were added to their number daily. Day by day, people were added to their number. And the cool thing was is that they enjoyed the favor of all the people. I mean, when was the last time that we got to hear of churches that were enjoying the favor of all the people. You know, God's people demonstrated the good news by making the kingdom tangible. God's people de uh, demonstrated the good news by making the kingdom tangible. You see, disciples of Jesus, as they grow in their ability to reflect the character and priorities of Jesus in all of life, what do they do? They express the will of heaven on earth. Disciples of Jesus actually express the will of heaven on earth. And so the question for us is, how do we start? How could we start demonstrating the good news about Jesus in all of life? I'm gonna give you three ways that you could start this. The first one is with a life group, or with a, your friends, or with a family, with a group of people. Get a group of people together and talk and plan about how you could demonstrate the good news about Jesus and all of life. It does, it does a few things for you. Number one, it helps you to be creative. It helps you be, to be creative in your planning. Number two, it helps hold you accountable to what you say you're gonna do. And number three, and this is the best part, it's super encouraging to come back and tell your group the stories of what has happened as a result. This is happening all the time in our life groups. I just got an email from... Uh, from uh, one of our life group leaders talking about what they decided to do as a group. And what they decided to do was uh, they decided to pray through Galatians chapter five. 
as they, uh, about the fruit of the Spirit and ask God what spirit or what fruit of the Spirit could they demonstrate in a, in a tangible way. And so, uh, and then they listened. And then they went out into their world and they asked God, God, how can I demonstrate your fruit? And uh, this one lady tells a story about how she was in a grocery store and there was a senior who had a list and was having troubles actually finding and locating the items. And so not only did this person come alongside them and help them find their items, but they actually took the lady all through the store and helped her complete her list. It was amazing. It was amazing. I got tons of stories like that. So start with people, start with a life group, start with your family, start with friends to figure out how you, get a group of people to figure out how you can demonstrate the good news about Jesus. How else can you start? Well, with a risk, with a risk. You see, my family and I, the, fa- the neighborhood that we live in, Ajax, like a typical suburban neighborhood, what happens, people drive in, they get, in their, they get out of their cars and they walk right into their homes. And I mean, even if they see you, they will barely say hi, all right? It's kind of like, I'm going into my house, and that's, how, that's all we see. And so my wife and I were trying to figure out, man, how can we actually bring a neighborhood that is so fractured like ours, how can we start to bring it together so that people get to know one another? And so we watched, uh, uh, we watched the rhythms of our neighborhood and was like, well, what's going on in our neighborhood? When do people actually come out of their houses and uh, at least try to like, interact with the neighbors around them? It happens on Halloween. It happens on Halloween where they get out with their kids and they start walking around. And so my wife and I, what we decided to do was instead of having the kids come up to our porch where, we, where the, the parents kind of stand at the end of the driveway and, and, and send their kids up for the sweets, we took our candy and our table and we moved it to the end of our driveway. And I also make apple cider, which is world famous if you don't know yet. If you haven't experienced it, you should come over and have some apple cider with me. And so what we did was we had our table uh, with the candy, we had our speakers going, we put Monster Mash on, on repeat, and then uh, we had our, our, uh, our, my crock pot of cider. And so as people came by, the kids could grab candy and the parents could actually get the cider and it allowed my wife and I to actually interact with them and talk with them, it was amazing. And it actually created some conflict in our neighborhood, believe it or not. All right, we actually, there were two friends that um, <laughs> they came to our house and they were like, oh, I'm so glad you guys are still here. I told my friend, we gotta come to this street first and not go to that other street because if we don't, we're gonna miss the cider house. <laughs> and so we started with a risk to try to meet our neighbors, to try to get out there and create a place that wasn't so fractured. Another way that you can start demonstrating the good news about Jesus is actually with a need. When we were planting our home churches in Montreal, we became aware of a need uh, of, of a lady that was in our neighborhood. And so she had actually spent the last two weeks in a psychiatric hospital, and we know that spending two weeks in a hospital, well, what happens to all the food in your house? I mean, it rots, right? It goes bad. And so what we did as a family, once we found this out, was we, we uh, got the families in our home church together and we created a grocery list. And we divided the list up. It actually turned into a great game with our kids. We divided the list up and gave it to each, each family. Each family had part of the list. And then we ran through Superstore trying to get the items as fast as we could. And uh, uh, my family won. We were the, we were the fastest. And, uh, and it, was, it was amazing. And then what we did was we packed up the groceries and we went to our neighbor's house and when we opened the door, and we knocked on the doors, and she came there and opened it up, and the first thing she did was just started to cry. And my kids were kind of like taking about, why, why is she crying? Is she upset? You know, they didn't really understand that she, those were like tears of joy. Because no one had ever done anything like that before for her. And so she welcomed us in, and we got to put these groceries in her house and help, you know, get them uh, put away and all that kind of stuff. And the best part of it was as parents, we got to demonstrate to our kids what it meant to demonstrate the good news about Jesus and all of life. You see, these demonstrations of the good news about Jesus may be small, but the reality is they express to the world that there is a new way to live. And the more we practice demonstrating the good news about Jesus and all of life, the greater the transformative effect we will have on the world. You see, these aren't just one-offs. These aren't just one-offs. This is a practice that disciples of Jesus do. I want to close with this quote from uh, Cherith Fee Nordling. 
who is doing some amazing things about uh, teaching people how to live life on mission. She's a real leader uh, amongst people in this area. And she says this, I think people are hungry. Hungry to actually find out whether God is really present and whether the church can really function as a people who really do image in their life together the power and presence of God as it is seen in the life of Jesus. She believes people are hungry for this. They want to see the good news of Jesus demonstrated. They want to experience that because it lets them know that God is real and that God is there. So I wanna read this to you one more time and where it says, I think people, there's a blank that's gonna pop up. And what I want you to do is I want you to insert in that space, I want you to insert the name of someone that you could actually demonstrate the good news of Jesus to in a tangible way. I mean, maybe it's a family friend, or maybe it's family, maybe it's a coworker. I'm not sure who it is. I'm just gonna give you a moment to think about that as I read it. So here we go. I think blank. Insert your name there is hungry to actually find out whether God is really present and where the church can really function as a people who really do image in their life together the power and presence of God as seen in the life of Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for the fact that when you call us to do something, when you call us to live as disciples, you don't just send us out with no guides or anything like that, but God, you sent Jesus into the world who demonstrated the good news to us in so many practical ways. So God, I pray for us as we seek to do that same thing, as we seek to demonstrate the difference that knowing Jesus and knowing that good news makes in our life. God, that it would have a transformative effect on our world, that it would have a transformative effect on those to whom we demonstrate this to. God, I pray these things in your name. Amen.